Okay, welcome back. So now we are going to talk specifically about alcohol, sedatives, and opiates. So we'll start with alcohol. Alcoholism, there is no antidote for alcoholism. Um, it is a stimulant, or excuse me, uh, stimulants should not be given for alcoholism. Um, alcohol may be removed from the body by gastric lavage or dialysis if there's an acute um, toxico toxicity from the alcohol and life-threatening. Otherwise, gastric lavage and dialysis are typically not used. Um, what we want to be assessing for is use. Again, every time you come in contact with the patient, um, patients are often going to underestimate their use, and we as nurses need to ask those tough questions. Um, we can use screening tools, and again, um, we can use labs. Um, if we look at liver function tests, um, you can possibly identify alcoholism early um, because the AST is going to be elevated first um, before the ALT. So if you do liver function tests, and you see an elevated AST in, in, a, in a normal ALT that may give you some indication that there might be some chronic alcohol abuse going on. So alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. Um, you can see the statistics there on your slide, but basically um, how it works is that it affects the neurons in the central nervous system, um, specifically GABA and glutamate. So alcohol mimics GABA in the brain and binds to the GABA receptors and inhibits signals. Dopamine is also involved in that overall feeling of euphoria. Okay, so you get the um, slowing down of responses because it is um, uh, altering that GABA. Remember, GABA was the slowing down receptor. And then it's also triggering that brain reward system by resulting in the release of dopamine, um, promoting that addictive um, behavior. Alcohol is absorbed in the stomach and in the intestines. Uh, slower absorption is present when a person has had food or um, water. Faster absorption occurs when they mix the alcohol with a carbonated liquid, okay? Um, it can damage pretty much every cell in the body, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later in, in the lecture here. It does cross the placenta, so we will have um, effects on the unborn child or the fetus if the mother drinks, and, and we'll talk about that also. Um, alcohol is metabolized in the liver, so for approximately one drink, it takes an hour to metabolize. Elimination occurs through the kidneys and the lungs. So what we do know is one standard drink contains roughly about 14 grams of pure alcohol. Um, so say for a 12 ounce beer, um, there's about 5% alcohol in it. Um, if we're talking about a five, ounce, uh, 5 ounces of wine, um, there's approximately 12% alcohol. And then for, say, an ounce or an ounce and a half of hard liquor is 40% alcohol. So when you're looking at what is moderate or low-risk drinking, Research has shown that people who drink moderately may be um, less likely to experience alcoholism. Um, men, uh, for men, excuse me, um, four drinks in a single day and no more than 14 drinks in the entire week would be considered a low-risk drinking. Now for women, it's lower. So it's three drinks in a day or seven drinks um, in a week. Now heavy or high risk drinking um, would be consuming more than the single day or weekly amounts just mentioned, okay? About one in four people who drink above these levels already have some type of alcohol dependence um, or alcohol abuse problem. 
binge drinking, you've probably heard about this. Binge drinking means um, drinking so much in a short period of time. So binge drinking would be um, like um, having several drinks within two hours of time and the body can't metabolize it fast enough. And so the blood alcohol levels reach um, the 0.08 um, very quickly. For women, this usually occurs after about four drinks and for men it's about five. Now blood alcohol concentration, what is that? The con it's the concentration of alcohol in the body that can be, be determined by assessing the blood alcohol content of the blood. So this is really important. The blood alco alcohol content in dependent um, patients is how much alcohol is consumed, how much uh, how fast it's consumed and dependent on the individual's weight. So blood alcohol content is again uh, based on three factors and that is how much is consumed, how fast it's consumed, and the weight of the person. Um, so for a person who is a non-dependent drinker or that low risk category, the blood alcohol content is fairly predictable of the um, alcohol's effects on the body. For chronic al alcohol users or alcoholics, um, they're able to drink larger amounts without obvious impairment because there's that tolerance effect, right? Um, blood, al blood alcohol content levels um, can be several times higher for a dependent or chronic drinker than for a non-tolerant drinker before you see the effects of that alcohol on their performance or their functioning. Um, little tolerance develops um, regarding respiratory depression. So it doesn't matter if you're a low risk drinker or a high risk drinker, um, respiratory depression uh, will occur equally in both groups. Chronic heavy alcohol users reach the lethal blood alcohol level at almost the same uh, time or level as non-chronic users. So nursing assessment and interventions, again, um, we're going to be wanting to get that history and physical. We want to be screening for coexisting medical or psychological problems. Again, um, substance abuse and mental illness coexist almost all of the time. Um, we want to um, be using assessment tools. So um, in Blackboard, uh, in the first learning plan, and I think I also put them in this learning plan, are some screening tools that you should look at. Um, that can be used when uh, doing the screening with the individual. And the reason that the screening tools are so important is because it gets away from that subjective information and gives us something that we can objectively use to identify um, problem uh, drinking. So the SBIRT is a, it stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. Okay, the CAGE acronym stands for um, Cut, Annoyed, Guilt, and I. And what does that mean? So the CAGE assessment uses four question, yes, no questions to help determine if there's um, uh, alcohol dependency going on. So the four questions would be, have you ever felt you should cut down on your drinking? That's where you get the cut from, okay? Have people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking? The A, annoyed, okay? Have you ever felt bad or guilty about your drinking? So there's your G, guilty. And have you ever had a drink first thing in the morning to steady your nerves or get rid of a hangover? And that is the eye-opening statement, okay? There's another one called the um, SMAST. It stands for Short Michigan Alcoholism Screening Test. Um, the CAST is another very common one um, that is used to identify adolescent and grown-up um, children of alcoholics. And then the CRAFT uh, screening tool is specific to teens. Okay. Um, interventions that we would uh, want to be using. 
are based on this frames model and I did post that in Blackboard also so that you could go through and see what that looks like. But basically it's a model to affect behavior change. It allows the nurse to take advantage of any interaction with the abuser um, as an opportunity to try and manage their behaviors. So it's providing feedback to the, to the person about their a risk. Um, again, um, telling them about the responsibility of their own personal control, advising them to change, um, using empathy, and um, being optimistic. We already had kind of went over those before. So if we look at the next slide, these are all the long-term effects, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, obviously, you can um, read the sl slide, but I did want to point out some common problems that um, we see uh, occurring from long-term effects of alcoholism. The first one is called Wernick's encephalopathy, and this is really an emergency situation. Um, and it is uh, identified by a triad of symptoms, That's, and those are confusion, nystagmus, and gait problems. Um, it is preventable and it is reversible. What happens is it's an inflammatory, hemorrhagic condition in the brain um, resulting from deficiencies in thiamine um, due to malnutrition of, of the chronic alcoholism. Now, thiamine is absorbed in the intestines, and we have about 18 days of thiamine stores in our body. Thiamine helps um, neurotransmitters in the brain, and it helps with um, glucose use and carbohydrate use in our metabolism. So if we have a decreased uh, thiamine, it will result in basically psychosis and encephalopathy. Okay. So it's important that you, you um, remember that one. Um, obviously, we have problems with the liver. If you remember, um, alcohol is metabolized in the liver, and therefore, over time, it is going to cause chronic problems, um, such as fatty liver, hepatitis, and cirrhosis. Um, we also know that we can get a condition called hep hepatic encephalopathy. Um, so basically, again, this is confusion that can result in coma, and it's caused by the liver failure, and it's, a, it's an accumulation of toxins that normally would be removed from the liver but are not being removed because the liver is failing. So an example of this would be ammonia levels. So we can do blood testing to check for ammonia levels. And the treatment for um, this situation would be the use of laxatives to try and clear those toxins out of the body. Um, and one common laxative that's used is called lactulose. Um, liver failure, um, you can notice some outward signs of that. And that would be uh, jaundice, um, if they have ascites, and uh, Oftentimes, they will have an inverted sleep-wake cycle. Another um, area that is, uh, is of concern and affected quite often is the GI and the pancreas. So we get um, pancreas, or not we, um, abusers get pancreatitis quite often, and it's caused by that chronic inflammation um, in the body. So... Um, there's another thing that's called Barrett's esophagus. Um, this is uh, basically it's caused from GERD, this chronic GERD, and it erodes the, um, the lining of the esophagus, and it has been found to be a precursor to esophageal cancer. Again, pancreatitis, as we increase that alcohol limit, lip, uh, excuse me, alcohol enzyme, um, digestive enzymes are secreted by the pancreas predisposing um, that gland to what we call an auto uh, digestion kind of a syndrome. So pancreatitis is another symptom you're going to see with um, chronic alcohol abusers. Um, cardi cardiac problems, um, you can get arrhythmias, hypertension, and primarily alcohol 
ism will cause an increase of excretion of magnesium. We know that from our kidney uh, learning plans we've had in the past that um, magnesium is excreted through the kidney. When you increase alcohol consumption, you know it acts like a diuretic and there's a lot of excretion through the kidneys and you're gonna lose magnesium. And if you remember from your cardiac learning plans, magnesium is essential for that normal cardiac functioning. So if we have a low magnesium level, we're gonna have a higher incidence of arrhythmias. Um, and I, that's about what I wanted to sum up on this slide. I will mention in the left lower corner there you can see a child. Now again, remember alcohol does um, cross the placenta. So um, one, a woman's use of alcohol during pregnancy can cause what we call um, fetal alcohol syndrome. There is no safe amount. There is um, all types of alcohol have the same effects and what happens is these children um, it will have long-term not only the physical problems that you can see in the picture but they will have long-term problems also such as learning or memory problems emotional problems um, communication problems uh, social problems and behavioral problems in the in the long term so not good for our youth. All right, let's talk about alcohol withdrawal. Um, so a non-dependent drinker will experience a hangover. Okay, this is a minor reaction to alcohol. Um, we at one point in our time probably have experienced this hangover effect. Withdrawal syndrome is should be anticipated if the individual reports consumption of more than 10 drinks every day for a period of two weeks. Um, four characteristic signs of withdrawal are going to be gross tremors, possibly seizures, hallucinations, and that alcohol withdrawal delirium. So alcohol withdrawal, um, the early signs of withdrawal will develop within a few hours after they stop drinking. Um, this is something that you're going to remember. Alcohol withdrawal will normally occur within 4 to 12 hours of stopping the, or of their last drink. Now, withdrawal typically peaks between 24 to 48 hours and then rapidly starts to um, disappear. Um, symptoms are going to be hyper-alertness, um, jerky movements, irritability, um, they may startle easily. Um, they're going to uh, tell you they're ha having some, you know, subjective, they're going to subjectively say they're having some um, distress or they feel like they're shaky inside. Now, withdrawal seizures actually can be grand mal seizures. Um, these usually occur anywhere from 7 to 48 hours after they stop their last drink. Um, particularly in people who have a history of seizures. So when you're doing your screening, you're going to want to be asking them about any seizure history or have they ever tried to stop drinking before and had a seizure as a result of it. Um, this would um, indicate to you that you're going to want to put some safety measures in place for seizures such as fall precautions, um, putting padded uh, pads on the side rails, so if they have a seizure, they can't harm themselves. Um, these people can get alcohol illusions. Um, illusions are usually very terrifying for these patients. Um, they're misinterpretations of something that's in an object or something that's in their environment. So an illusion might be um, if there is uh, something hanging off the end of their bed. They may misinterpret it or have the illusion that it's a snake or something. That, that would be an alcoholic illusion. Um, alcohol withdrawal delirium, this is what we call DTs. Now our goal as nurses in this cascade of withdrawal is that we do not want to let our patients get to the level of delirium. Alcohol um, delirium is actually considered a medical emergency and it can result in death. 
Um, death is usually related to sepsis or having a, a myocardial infarct, um, some kind of electrolyte imbalance, maybe an aspiration, um, or suicide. Okay, so delirium can peak anywhere from two to three days, again that 48 to 72 hours after cessa cessation of, of drinking. And it can last two to three days once it has started. So what are the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal delirium? Um, it's going to be some of the other symptoms you've seen, anxiety, insomnia, um, they're going to have a hyperactive um, kind of response, which is going to result in tachycardia. They're going to be diaphoretic. Their blood pressure is going to be elevated. Um, they're going to have severe disturbance in sen sensory, so they're going to be disoriented, um, cloudy of consciousness. They're going to have those perceptual disturbances, and they can be visual or tactile hallucinations. Um, they're going to have fluctuating levels of consciousness, ranging from being hyper excitable to being lethargic. Um, they're also going to have delusions, or they're, they're going to be paranoid or um, agitated. And one of the key symptoms that you're going to want to be watching for is fevers. You're going to get this elevated body response and have elevated fevers, anywhere from 100 to 103 degrees. So, what or how and how do we keep them from getting to this um, withdrawal delirium? So we use in the hospital something called the alcohol withdrawal assessment, and it's called the CEWA. So this is something else that you're going to be want to be very familiar with. The CEWA scale is used all the time in the hospital setting, and basically what you're doing is you're assessing vitals, you're assessing for nausea and vomiting. You're assessing their anxiety level. You're looking for sweats. Um, you're trying to determine if they're having any um, perceptual um, disturbances, um, visual disturbances. Are they having tremors? Are they agitated? What is their orientation level? Uh, and uh, fever and headache is another thing that this scale uses. So based on the scale, we can identify a number or a, a severity level the person is experiencing and um, give them some medication to offset these, um, these symptoms and uh, stop them from getting to the, to the re, uh, level of delirium. I hope that makes sense. So what do we treat them with? We treat them with thiamine. Again, we know from the previous lectures or the previous slides that we are going to be low on thiamine. So we will be giving them supplemental um, thiamine. We're going to be giving them um, multivitamins and folic acid. Oftentimes we're going to be hanging a bag. We call it a banana bag. And um, the reason we call it that is because it actually has a yellow color. So this banana bag or this IV fluid is going to supplement all of the deficiencies that an alcoholic typically has and try and get those things back in the body to offset this imbalance. Okay, um, We're going to be wa wanting to watch their glucose level. Um, many uh, patients will experience hypoglycemia related to their decreased food intake. So we may be giving them um, added glucose in that banana bag to uh, offset this, um, this phenomenon with alcoholics. Um, the other medication that we often give are the benzodiazepines, right? So we want to decrease the intensity of the withdrawal symptoms by um, blocking those receptors with the benzo and allowing that GABA to have its slowing effect on the body. Haldol is another drug that we may use, um, and that is specifically to target that, um, those hallucinations and perceptual disturbances the person is having. And then we may be giving some Tegretol or Dilantin um, to prevent that seizure activity that can, can um, come with uh, the withdrawal. So how do we want to handle patients who are going through withdrawal? 
we're going to be kind, we're going to be warm, we're going to be supportive. Um, we're going to convey calmness to try and alleviate some of the anxiety. We're going to um, give that person that sense of safety and that we are there to help them through this. Um, consistent and frequent orientation to time and place is important. And encouraging the family or close friends um, to stay with that person so that they always have somebody there um, as a support system to help them through you know, because the nurse, we have many patients. We can't always be there. So getting friends and family to be involved in spending time with the uh, patients is going to support the patient and also support us in our um, ability to care for all of our patients. Um, we're going to decrease uh, stimulation in the environment. So we're going to keep things quiet, maybe a little darker, um, just to decrease that anxiety level. So follow-up treatment, I mean, once we get the person through that first three days of withdrawal, we're going to want to um, strongly encourage the person to transfer to a rehab uh, facility to sustain that abstinence and um, prolong that long-term goal of, of being abstinent. Um, education and support, again, are a huge um, uh, help for people who are trying to abstain from substance abuse. Medications that we can use to help people with their long-term goal of staying um, dry um, is one medication is called antabuse. Um, antabuse is used to prevent drinking by causing an unpleasant reaction if the person consumes alcohol. So some of these um, adverse reactions they're going to get is flushing of the face, um, they're going to get intense vasodilation of the face, neck, and upper body. Um, they may hyperventilate, they may have some palpitations, um, they're going to get nauseated and possibly vomit. Um, it will cause a headache, sweating, thirst, um, weakness, blurred vision, um, hypotension. So usually the effects um, when this happens will last anywhere from 30 minutes to several hours. And it is brought on again by the ingest ingestion of as little as 7 milliliters of alcohol. In the absence of alcohol, um, it, it has no effect on the person, okay? Um, so we want to make sure that if, the, if our patient is put on antabuse, that we are educating them to not consume any alcohol whatsoever and educating them on the, if they do, what their reaction to their body is going to be. Um, we need to educate them on all food um, and liquid medications that could possibly um, uh, have a component of alcohol in it. And what I mean by that is um, multiple mouthwashes have alcohol in them, so simply uh, using mouthwash could precipitate this, this terrible effect or this negative effect if they're on antabuse. Um, some aftershaves and colognes um, or perfumes have alcohol in them. Um, cold medicines sometimes have alcohol in them. So we have to be very, very careful and educate our patients on these products. Um, Antabuse is usually self-administered. Um, the client must be highly motivated to abstain from drinking um, because it would be very easy for them to just not take the antabuse because they know what effect it would have if they drank and just not take the antabuse and go ahead and, and drink. Okay, another drug that we will use often is called Campril. Campril is used to decrease unpleasant feelings such as tension, anxiety, and cravings when they're trying to abstain from alcohol. It is thought to act on the brain's pathways related to alcohol abuse, that um, pleasure pathway. Um, dosing should be started immediately after the detox has occurred and then continue um, even if relapse occurs. It is not addicting, um, but it is oftentimes not as effective of 
the next drug that we're going to talk about. So combining Campril with um, naltrexone, which is the, the next drug we're going to discuss, um, if you combine those two, it is more effective than just giving the Campril alone. Okay. Um, the most common side effect of this um, Campril might be some diarrhea or uh, flatulence or maybe some nausea. So let's talk about naltrexone, okay? Naltrexone, excuse me. Naltrexone, what that does is decrease cravings from alcohol and it actually blocks the desired effects of alcohol, okay? So Campril is the one that's going to decrease the craving. Naltrexone is the one that if they drink, the drink will have no effect on them. They will not get that euphoria that they normally would get from drinking. Okay, um, It's usually prescribed um, 50 milligrams once a day um, and it's and is the usual dose for alcohol dependency. Um, it is available in an injectable form that's given intramuscularly once a month if a person is not real good about taking medication every day. You can choose this injectable form, which is monthly. Okay, so let's talk about um, sedatives and hypnotics. Sedatives and hypnotics are also a CNS depressant. Um, these all have therapeutic uses, however, in patients um, can get addicted and they may be may, excuse me, they may misuse the drugs. So again, so if you think about anxiety, we often give benzodiazepines for anxiety. Um, so since benzodiazepines are a sedative, um, they can become addictive. People can become addictive to it. So you're going to see benzodiazepines not being ordered on a long-term basis. It's going only to be ordered on a PRN and they're going to be given very small amounts um, just to initially get over, say, an anxiety or panic attack. Again, benzodiazepines affect the GABA. And as we've learned before, GABA is that slowing down neurotransmitter. So obviously the effects of the benzos are going to be sedative. So some common um, benzodiazepines that you're going to see in your practice are going to be Xanax, Valium, um, Ativan, and Clonopin. Another sedative are barbiturates. Barbiturates are often used um, to control seizures. Um, so phenobarb might be a common one that you um, might be might have heard of. Um, so again, these drugs are used um, therapeutically, but also can become an addictive problem. Um, and as the person uses them, they will um, build a tolerance and require higher doses of these medications to be therapeutic. Um, overdoses uh, rarely are fatal. Um, you'd have to take large doses combined with, say, alcohol or another type of central nervous system depressant um, to actually result in death. And if some, some, uh, something happens because of this, uh, the sedatives, it oftentimes is related to um, respiratory failure. Because as you know, CNS depressants re uh, also depress the respiratory um, mechanisms and we can have some respiratory failure. Biochemistry in action, we already talked about that it affects our GABA. Um, typically they're taken orally or intravenously. Intravenously obviously would be in a hospital setting only. Um, the effects that they're intended for is for relaxation. Uh, again, long-term, they can uh, build a tolerance, and um, they can also have a cross-tolerance occur with other antidepressants. Um, tolerance develops rapidly, requiring higher doses to, reach, uh, re, um, to achieve the therapeutic response that you're looking for. Um, uh, 
Again, if we are taking these medications, that tolerance can lead to some hypertension and respiratory depression um, resulting in death, which we already um, uh, mentioned, okay? So withdrawal, what does it look like when withdraw we are withdrawing from um, sedatives? The first priority is going to be your ABCs, right? So let's see, after about 12 to 16 hours of not having the sedative, a person is going to start exhibiting some of those symptoms such as anxiety, agitation, insomnia, maybe some sweating and tremors, very similar to alcohol withdrawal. After about um, 24 hours or one day of no use, um, we get into that area where they can have delir delirium, seizures, and, and possibly um, death, okay? Um, so the withdrawal is very similar to withdrawal of alcoholism, if you can try and keep that in mind. Um, symptoms of withdrawal will peak uh, again second or third day for short-acting drugs like um, Xanax and seven or eight days for long-acting drugs such as um, diazepine or phenobarb. Okay? So knowing what the person is taking is going to be very important to understanding um, when you can expect some of these withdrawal uh, uh, things to occur. Now, withdrawal, um, the way that sedatives are different from alcohol withdrawal is that um, we can stop the withdrawal effects if we use a tapering uh, withdrawal rather than an abstinence withdrawal. So with alcoholism, remember, no drinks. Abstinence was the goal. Now with sedatives, the goal is going to be to taper. You're going to want to remember that. Um, taper off slowly from sedatives, okay? Um, there is an antidote for sedatives and hypnotics and that is Remazicon. Now whenever you're dealing with withdrawal, you're always going to want to know if there is an antidote. And there is not per se an antidote for alcohol, but for sedatives there is, and that is Remazicon. Okay, it is a benzodiazepine antagonist. Um, it is typically not used for long-term benzodiazepine use. Um, and it may precipitate withdrawal and seizures. So there, there is no antagonist for barbiturates. You, you want to remember that. The Remazicon is an antagonist for benzodiazepines only. Okay, so we are going to move on to opiates. Opioids um, are again often times prescribed for therapeutic uses but can be um, uh, misused and, or obtained illegally, okay? Um, so typically the people who are obtaining it illegally constitute the largest group of abusers of opioids. Some examples of opioids are common things that we are well aware of in our clinical experiences. It's the pain medications that we're giving out. So oxycodone, which is your Percocet, hydrocodone, which is your Vicodin, um, fentanyl patches, morphine, codeine, um, hydromorphone, which is our Dilaudid, and meperidine, which is the Demerol. We give those every day in our practice. Um, and we have to be very cognizant that this can become an addictive problem for these people and be very conscious with our education to our patients about this. Um, heroin also is an opioid um, and heroin is one of the most widely abused opiates out there. Opiates are drugs that are derived from the opium poppy plant, okay, with or without further synthetic modif modification. So Again, morphine, codeine, and heroin are all in the same class. Opioids are any compounds that can bind to opiate receptors in the brain and produce effects um, 
uh, uh, characteristic of that euphoric feelings, okay? So opioids, um, current impact, um, obviously there are street use, there is street use of heroin. Um, we do have medical abusers, people who have been prescribed the medication and end up becoming addicted and misusing it. Um, these people who have been put on medication, one of the uh, symptoms that you may see with them is that um, they try and divert medication. So they go and see multiple healthcare providers to try and get um, multiple prescriptions of the medication. Um, methadone abuse, um, that is a black market kind of a situation. Um, so heroin, let's talk about heroin. Heroin has now become uh, more of a problem due to our um, prescribing uh, oxycontin or roxycodone, okay? You may be familiar with those. Um, oxycontin is a time-release drug and it acts uh, for about 12 hours. It's much harder to get a high if abused. Oxycodone medications are those short acting and they need to be taken every four to six hours. So individuals who, who abuse opioids include um, illegal dr drug selling and people who are actually prescribed the medication. Um, those who begin drug use illegally um, obviously constitute the largest group of abusers. Um, another significant group of abusers is healthcare professionals um, who may, uh, you know, divert the medication from their workplace um, and become uh, dependent on it. Okay, um, drugs are read readily accessible to us. Um, and, you know, people uh, can be um, develop that dependence and that craving and it over, it, um, what am I trying to say, it overcomes their rational thinking as a healthcare provider and they become hooked just like every other um, drug abuser because of that crave. So biochemistry in action. Um, it activates um, endogenous opioids in the brain with, and, and triggers that brain reward system. Um, there are several ways that it is taken. Um, more commonly in the street setting, it's going to be oral, sniffed, or smoked, right? The effects that it gives that make it so addicting is that euphoria, um, that uh, just, you know, they can escape from everything because they have that um, decreased uh, mental alertness, that um, perception of pain, um, things like that, and it can just cause that escape kind of um, effect in the brain. Now, heroin, it, so it has that euphoria, that analgesic kind of effect, makes them feel drowsy, detached from the environment, very relaxed. Um, you might notice some constricted pupils. Um, it decreases their respiratory rate again. So, um, you know, your ABCs are very important when you're looking at withdrawal. Um, it may cause some slurred speech, some impairment in their judgment, and decreased sexual um, drive also. So heroin is one of the most widely abused uh, opiates as I've mentioned before. Um, heroin intoxication can be classified into four phases. Um, the first is that euphoria or that rush they get. The second phase is the high or that sense of well-being. Um, the third they call the nod or it's that escape from reality, right? that lethargy, that virtual unconsciousness. And fourth is the period of withdrawal that occurs. And that is usually the phase in which they're going to seek more drugs to get back to that euphoric feeling. So withdrawal um, per usually develops um, I would say eight to ten hours after the last dose of the medication. 
Withdrawal is going to peak um, anywhere from 36 to 48 hours, and it will usually subside after 96 hours. Um, withdrawal from the short-acting opiates will resolve in 7 to 14 days. Now, withdrawal from long-acting um, op opioids is going to be significantly longer, possibly several weeks. Um, withdrawal from opiates is very uncomfortable and it can be life-threatening. So what are some of the symptoms uh, that they're going to get? They're going to possibly get some muscle spasm, spasming. Um, pupils might be dilated. They may have sweating, fever. Um, they may now start to experience pain and this pain can persist for up to three to six months after they've stopped taking the opioids. They might have some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or abdominal cramping. Um, they may have like a runny nose or what we call rhinorrhea. Um, another sign would be yawning, some insomnia. Obviously they're going to be restless and irritable and have some anxiety. Okay. Um, unintentional overdose of opioids um, frequently occurs when it's being recreationally misused, okay? And whatever form they're using illegally is unpredictable as to the potency and, and purity of that substance. So the reactions or the overdoses can be difficult because we don't really know what to expect. Um, overdoses, um, is a, is a medical emergency. Um, and we're going to want to be monitoring those ABCs again, vitals, respiratory status. Again, as a nurse, you want to know if there is an antidote. And there is an antidote, and it's called Narcan. Um, this is a reversal agent for opiates. So remember that, Narcan for opiates. All right. So... How do we um, treat uh, people who are uh, uh, abusers? So uh, we're going to again be assessing for um, medical problems that could contribute to um, the withdrawal symptoms. Um, we're going to be giving uh, medications and usually these medications are going to be um, based on the cows uh, screening tool or uh, withdrawal tool that we're going to be using. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what the um, the COWS stand for again. It's opiate withdrawal syndrome, um, but I can't think of what the C is. I told you guys before, but now I forget. I'm looking back here. COWS. Um, shoot. Oh, I have it right on the screen. How silly of me. Clinical opiate withdrawal scale. Clinical. How easy is that? So we're going to be using this, um, just like we did for alcoholism, we had the CWA scale. Um, for opiates, we're going to be using the COW scale to try and rate the severity of their withdrawal symptoms. And then based on that score that we get, we can treat them with some certain medications. So the first one is clonidine. Clonidine um, reduces the norepinephrine release. It is most effective in suppressing that autonomic um, signs and symptoms from ab ab abstinence or that um, tapering that we're going to be doing. So basically, what does it do? It's an anti, it has anti-craving effects on the person. Now, clonidine combined with, with naltrexone, you remember naltrexone, um, is the best uh, combination for treating opioid withdrawal. It's very rapid, um, and it decreases hypertension and then it has a really good effect on helping people detox uh, quicker. It, base, it will shorten the withdrawal uh, time frame by about five days. Methadone is another uh, treatment modality. 
Um, there is a facility in Wisconsin, not in Wisconsin, in Wassa called the Wassa Health Services Methadone Clinic. Um, it's located right up by the mall. It used to be the old um, train station, and that is where it's located. So methadone, um, it's used as an opioid agonist for detoxing or withdrawal. Um, it's used to decrease dosing after 10 to 14 days. Um, it's substitu substituting oral methadone for the abused uh, opioids that are used um, to decrease the withdrawal syndrome and increase safety for these people by avoiding um, some of the uh, drug use, use lifestyles that they're used to. So it's a maintenance program that alters the, the drug use um, by keeping them fr safe from uh, but, uh, using needles, uh, keeping them safe from being exposed to HIV and hepatitis, and uh, making sure that they're getting safe doses of the medication. Okay, so methadone is an addictive drug, but it can be used for maintenance programming by having that tight control over what uh, the person is getting. And then over time, they're going to be decreasing those doses, weaning the people off until they're completely off, okay? That tapering process can take up to a year to accomplish, all right? Suboxone is another drug that's often used. It is, it's also given at the methadone clinic. Um, it's used to maintain abstinence and decrease those cravings. Suboxone is different than methadone because it um, uh, contains uh, naloxone. And naloxone uh, is a uh, as a substance that blocks, actually blocks that euphoria feeling. So even if they took the opioid, um, it would block any effects from uh, that drug use, okay? Um, it is usually prescribed in a pill form, so the person can take this, uh, self-administer it, um, and it's specific action is to uh, uh, decrease the symptoms of withdrawal and suppress that drug craving, okay? Um, the potential of withdrawal is minimal from Suboxone if taken as prescribed, okay? Now, that last one we already kind of talked about was um, naltrexone. Again, that is the blocking um, effect or the blocking of any uh, euphoric or opioid effects if if the substance is taken. Okay. So um, again, the naltrexone is often given with the clonidine um, because the clonidine will stop the cravings and the naltrexone will actually block the effects if any drug is taken. Um, Narcan, again, is the reversal agent that we're going to be targeting for any overdose. And as a matter of fact, in 2014, Narcan was approved by the FDA um, to be um, given in the form of an auto-injector so that friends and family members of um, opioid abusers would be able to have that on hand if any kind of an overdose uh, situation ha happened and they needed to give something very quickly. Okay, that will sum up that section. Uh, the next lecture is going to be on cocaine, amphetamines, and uh, hallucinogens. So we will resume for that.